Tēnā koutou katoa, and kia ora. I'm David Shanks, New Zealand's Chief Censor, and it's a privilege to be speaking to you all here at the Involve Conference. I'm here to tell you a story about things that I've learned as Chief Censor over the last three years. And they're things that may be actually quite obvious to many of you, but for me, it wasn't what I expected to learn. You see, three years ago when I started as the Chief Censor, I knew I had a huge challenge ahead of me. My role was to keep the public and our rangatahi and tamariki safe from harmful media. Media that could traumatise people. Media that could haunt young people's imaginations. Media that could remind people of some of the darkest times of their lives. And yet, in order to address those issues, I was equipped with tools that really weren't up to the task. And this became really obvious to me within a few weeks of arriving into my role as Chief Censor, when the show 13 Reasons Why dropped on Netflix. This was a show that had massive ramifications around the world and raised concern everywhere. But this was a show about a teenage girl committing suicide and explaining her reasons for doing that, uh, landing in a country which has amongst some of the worst teen suicide levels in the world. And I never saw it coming. And why was that? Because you see, the legislation that I had to work with, the legis legislation that equipped me to keep young people safe in this country was drafted in 1993. In 1993, film reels still arrived at our shores in big containers to be showed at cinemas. In 1993, DVDs weren't even a thing yet. In 1993, the world of Netflix, YouTube, streamed videos, TikTok, that was all a quarter of a century in the future. So this was a world that my act hadn't even imagined. So this new smartphone equipped, digitally enabled media world had all kinds of opportunities and many, many positive things to bring to the community and to young people. But it brought many challenges as well. And I knew I had a very significant challenge. And initially, I thought the best way of addressing that would be to speak really loudly, to be heard, to shout over the digital noise. But in fact, what I've learnt is actually the opposite. In order to be effective in what I need to do, I need to listen more. I need to listen to young people in particular to understand what's going to help them, what we can do to support them in these challenging environments. And in order to, to understand more about my journey and my officer's journey to understand that, it's, it's worth understanding a bit more about what we do. You see, the work that we do can be broken down into two main components. We do commercial work, and because my ex still thinks it's 1993, we pretty much see every movie that's released at the cinemas that might have serious impacts or harms. And yet, when those same movies are released on streaming services or other channels to young people within a matter of weeks of being shown at the cinema, often the warnings and age classifications that we've worked so hard to put around those products can vanish or change or become incomprehensible. So that's one significant challenge we were facing on the commercial side, and yet just as much work is undertaken in what we call the crown work or criminal work. This is material referred to us by the police or customs or digital safety unit at internal affairs. And this is often very serious, impactful criminal material, sometimes involving child sexual abuse. 
but there's many other categories in this uh, type of media as well. And perhaps the most notable for some of you, and unfortunately memorable for many in this country, was the work that we did following the mosque attacks on March 15 last year with the horrific live stream video that went viral and was distributed across many digital platforms. And that was a video due to its horrific violence and its promotion of terrorist ideals was classified and banned, classified as objectionable and unlawful under New Zealand law. The thing that I appreciated though in the aftermath of those terrible events was that the people who were most impacted, the people who most typically viewed the whole live stream video, the people who often watched the whole thing before really understanding what it is that they were seeing, was typically young people. I've spoken to many groups subsequently asking them, how many of you saw the live stream in the immediate aftermath, the hours after that attack. And I've noticed one thing, the younger the audience, the more people viewed that live stream. And that brings it home to us that actually in what we're doing, it's young people that are first and foremost impacted and it's young people that we need to understand how to help. One of the fundamental challenges we had in our system was that it was designed to provide parents and guardians with helpful information and age ratings so that they could help keep their children safe. But increasingly, as we looked at what was happening today, we saw evidence that parents and their children are increasingly spending time in their own digital bubbles. They're not sharing the same media, they're not watching the same things, they're not talking together about what they see. And that meant we needed a change of tack. Young people are getting impacted by, by harmful material, by material that concerns them, that confuses them. They're still young people, they still need help and engagement but the evidence says that they're not getting this help. They're not talking to parents and guardians. They're often not talking even to each other about material that's concerning to them. And we knew that was something that needed to change. We need to, needed to think about what that told us about how we could equip young people, young teens in particular, uh, to watch material safely and constructively. One of the points about the digital divide that, that currently exists between parents and young people um, came through to us very, very clearly with our research on pornography in young people. Thanks to some tireless researchers in my office, some, some fantastic partners, and most importantly, more than 2,000 fearless, engaged, young 14 to 17 year olds in this country, we have some of the best research available to policymakers and frontline services anywhere in the world. Thanks to our quantitative survey, which we published back in 2018, we have a map of what young people are viewing how often they're viewing it, how young they are when they typically start seeing pornographic material. Thanks to our study into the most popular commercial porn on one of the, the biggest commercial porn sites, we have an understanding of what it is the young people are typically seeing in porn today. And most importantly, thanks to our recent study released during lockdown this year, we've got a quantitative study where a group of young people, 14 to 17 years of age, have told us really what their experience is, how they feel about the prevalence of pornography amongst young people today, how they feel about their own 
use of pornography and their concerns about what this means for people's attitudes towards sex, young people's expectations of each other, what it means to be in a healthy, loving relationship. We know from this research that young people think about these things that they have some very strong views about them and that they have some very real concerns. Concerns that we, adults, the government, serv help services and the community can actually help them navigate. Now, to get this level of engagement and honesty from young people about such a sensitive topic wasn't easy. We had to think through our approach and one of the things that we realised was that we couldn't bring our preconceived notions and expectations of what they thought and what they were going to tell us to this research. One of the key things that we did in fact on our qualitative study was to fight very hard in our ethics approval process to get approval for a process that would allow young people to engage in our research without getting approval from their parents first. And we thought this was really important in terms of ensuring that young people felt safe and able to engage directly with us on their terms. This was challenging, but it was worthwhile. And as a result of the direct, honest engagement that we had with young people on this topic, we were able to bring this experience to our partnership with the Department of Internal Affairs who were leading the campaign on Keep It Real Online, which some of you will have seen. And in fact, some of you may have seen the, the viral advertisement about pornographic content where two porn stars appear at a, at a domestic home um, talking about their concerns about the young lad who was watching their content on various devices. As we worked through some of the scripts and early drafts of presentation for that advertisement, we realised straight away how easy it was to potentially fall into stereotypes and cliches about how these performers would act, what their, what their manner was, what the expectations were of the parent concerned. And we were able to navigate through and help script an approach and a discussion that was light, honest and engaging. So the voices of young people were so important to us in terms of thinking about our work and how we could communicate it. In fact, quotes from young people from our research have been used in our material and animations on our site to help talk to young people, to give them support and guidance and tools, and also to talk to parents about how they can bridge that digital divide and have those important conversations with their children. Beyond that though, beyond the research that we've undertaken and that opportunity to engage with young people, we've gone further thinking about how we can integrate young people into the very core of our decision making and strategy and policies and processes. And part of that has involved pulling together a youth advisory panel, a group of 12 fantastic young people aged between 16 and 20 years of age. A fantastic group of engaged young rangatahi who work with us on a consistent basis to talk to us about their experience in this world and things that challenge them and things that can help them meet those challenges. It's, it can be quite a, a fun exercise being a youth advisory panel member. On one given day, you might be going to uh, a screening at a local cinema of a movie that's not going to be released for weeks yet. Um, and we could have pizza afterwards and discuss actually the content of the film and how some of the challenging content might be explained or warned 
uh, to young people. Even beyond that though, members of the Youth Advisory Panel have taken it on themselves to engage with decision-making processes at the highest level. Uh, remember I was telling you about streaming services and because of my act, I had no idea that uh, a show like 13 Reasons Why was about to be launched on New Zealand screens. Well, we've had a law change just passed that addresses that gap, addresses that issue. And as part of the select committee process to change the law to meet that gap, members of our youth advisory panel took it upon themselves to make a submission to the select committee and tell their truth to power. It was pretty cool. But even as we've made progress in these areas, even as we've managed to change the law, even as we've produced content tools and advice to help people navigate some of the challenges that I've talked about, technology, apps and the internet keeps changing the game. More and more challenges and issues keep arising. And as we talk to young people, we keep hearing more and more about these. We've spoken to young people and to partners such as NetSafe about the issues around nudes, for example. This behaviour in terms of exchanging intimate uh, visual images amongst young people uh, can range from a harmless display of intimacy to potentially highly impactful, brutal experiences involving young people being exploited. And young people are given very little advice and help to support them to navigate those waters. And it's not just, it's not just issues such as nudes. Beyond that, we're hearing about platforms such as OnlyFans, which is a platform that essentially seeks to monetize this sort of behavior. Recent research indicates that even though OnlyFans is intended as a platform to provide images for money for over 18 year olds, perhaps up to a third of individuals um, advertising content such as buy my nudes, uh, may be under 18. So this again is a growing challenge that seems to have brewed up out of nowhere that very few adults are talking about, but is commonly very well known amongst young people and even children. Even massively popular apps like TikTok can contain content involving young people seeking to become influencers through producing ever more sexualized content, even linking to an OnlyFans account or even a commercial pornography site in order to get noticed, in order to get money. In this way, we're increasingly seeing the internet and digital platforms seeking to hold out the promise of influence and fame and attention to young people, but is typically often only offering exploitation. So things are becoming very clear to us now. Technology in the digital sphere is going to keep throwing up new and complex challenges for us all. And rangatahi don't have all the answers to these problems, and nor do adults. In order to work out the solutions to these, these complex problems, we need to work together. That's the key thing that we have learned over our work of recent years. And a key element of this is listening to those who work closely with young people. What do you think? What are the issues coming up for you? What will really help? We are here to help and we are here to listen. That's the way we are going to navigate the challenges that the future will bring.